Hey guys, so I'm guessing you're probably wondering what's in this box, but um, actually, technically if you're watching this video, you probably already know what's in this box, so let's get started. Let's open her up, shall we? Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Very nice. Nice. Cue heavenly music. <laughs> hmm. Well, I'm not gonna say it's what I expected. What's up, creative crew? Will Simpson here, and welcome to Exploring Photography. Obviously, this is not the R5. Obviously, it wasn't in this box. I have been using it for the past three weeks. I didn't wanna do some silly unboxing thing when I've been using it for the past three weeks, I think, since I got it and getting experience with it. So in this video, what I wanted to go over is you see lots of videos about overheating and all of these some bad, some good about the R5. And I was like, you know what? I wanna know more about it. So I asked you on Instagram and I asked, what do you wanna know about it? So in this video, we're gonna go over the questions that I got and I got a ton. I can't get to all of them, unfortunately, but I did get quite a few and we're gonna go over some, give you some examples. All right, so the first question we're gonna go over is how much does it weigh? This was a interesting question, but it made sense to me because you kind of want to know what the camera's going to weigh. So I compared it to my Canon 6D, which my, was my original camera. You can compare it to yours, but let me get my notes because I had to write them down. You guys are actually going to be seeing the weighing scale, but I have my notes so I can follow along with you or you can follow along with me. One of the two. Either way, the camera body with the grip and the lens, the R5 came in at 4.43 pounds. Compared to the 6D, it came in at 4.42 pounds. So that's only 0.01 difference, super close, not worth comparing. The next thing is the body with the lens. The R5 came in at three and a half pounds, almost exactly, and the 6D came in at 3.49 pounds, almost exactly. So still we're very comparable. There's really no difference. You wouldn't even notice a difference depending on which one you were holding. But finally, we're gonna just look at the camera body itself. Now the R5 came in at 1.6 pounds. This is super light in my opinion. And the 6D came in at 1.69 pounds. Again, really not that big of a difference, but in the end, I guess the R5 is slightly lighter. The next question had to do with the adapter, the EF to RF adapter. And it's this little thing, it comes in this great little package and it looks kind of like the back of a lens. You have the EF on this side, you have the RF on this side. So what it does is you take your EF lens, take off obviously the lens cap, or not the lens cap, but the protective cover, take off this one, and then you're going to attach the EF lens to this part, and then this clips on to your R5 or your EF mount cameras. So the question was, do you lose quality? Do you lose f-stops and is there a crop? Now I did extenuous testing with this. The one thing that I really, really wanted to know was that this is the autofocus because the R5 has amazing autofocus and eye tracking. And so that was super important for me. I used the adapter with a 2470 EF. I used it with a 100 uh, EF 100 macro. I used it with the 7200 and I used it with a 1635 lens and I found zero degradation, zero. I was, couldn't, I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, this is amazing. So that means that there was no f-stop degradation. I could go on all of my lenses, there are 2.8, I could go all the way to 2.8. There was no crop, so I was shooting full frame, no problem with the, um, with the mount. The autofocus, this is what I was really, truly concerned about because that, makes a huge difference. If you have degradation in your autofocus when you're using a camera, it can mess up a whole shoot because if you're not familiar with how something is supposed to work or how it's going to work, like you think it's gonna do this and it does this, it could really mess up your shoot and that's no good. So I tested that quite a bit. I tested it, the eye focus on people. I tested the eye focus on animals. I tested just the general space auto focusing and it worked beautiful. I was amazed. The only thing that I did have an issue with was the autofocus for the 100 macro lens wasn't working very well and 
Honestly, it was user error. I was doing something wrong. I had it a wrong setting. And once I fixed that, then it zoomed right in and the focus was perfect. So overall, it was awesome. So you don't need to necessarily invest in the RF lenses right away. All right, the next question was about overheating. Now there are so many videos on overheating that I'm gonna be super brief about this. The question was simply, are you going to get the Tilta overheating mod, the Tilta fan mod? No, I am not. Um, honestly, I've had zero trouble with overheating. I'm not really putting the camera through massive 8K footage or massive 4K footage. I'm using it primarily as a photographer and YouTube B-roll and things like that. Yes, I go outside and shoot. Yes, it's hot as sh hot outside, but I am not running 8K for however long it's allowed. I'm not running 4K straight for as long as it's allowed. I have a, I have a little, ugh, a little beef with all of the overheating ruin the camera and overheating all this stuff because Honestly, the camera is an incredible photo camera. Maybe it was advertised wrong. Maybe 8K shouldn't have been pushed as much because this camera is such a good photo camera. I have loved taking pictures with it. It's so easy, so smooth. The quality of the photos is fantastic. So when everyone's hating on it because it's overheating, well, fine, it overheats. Sony cameras have overheated and it, you didn't see a big deal on that. So if you're buying this camera and you're gonna be shooting massive amounts of 8K, you shouldn't get this camera. It's as simple as that. You should be getting like a cinema camera or a camera built really to shoot in 8K. Anyways, that's, that's all I'm gonna say on overheating. No, I'm not gonna get the tilt to fan mod. I hear Canon has uh, put in a patent for a little ring to help with the, the airflow and stuff, but honestly, I've had zero trouble with the overheating and that's all. So let's go on to the next question, which is, is it good for bird photography? Now, I'm not really into uh, wildlife. I haven't done too much and I don't have really that much around me to test this out. However, I did test it with a bunch of chickens and I did test it with some animals and it works so good. If the, if the bird or animal is going crazy and it's all over the place, it, it, it's gonna lose tracking, but that's pretty much with anything. But if you got a, a smooth sailing bird or uh, an animal that's just kind of chilling there, it is pinpoint. You'll notice in this clip with all these chickens, you can't see the actual focus tracking, but you can see that it's in focus. But when I looked on the, the LCD screen and I was watching it, it stayed on the eye. When it lost the eye, it kind of expanded to the face until it found the eye again. So it was really smooth, really crisp, and you can actually, uh, you can cre increase the sensitivity so it's faster movement, which is really great. So I think it worked great. I did a little bit of research and watched some videos of people who do primarily wildlife and they all gave it rave reviews. So that I would say, yes, it is very good for birds and wildlife photography. Whew, that is a lot of information so far, but we're doing good. So let's get on to the next question. And that is how good is it in low light? All right, so this is a very sensitive subject for me. <laughs> ISO joke, gotta love it. Yeah, that was, okay. So this is a very interesting subject for me because I had the Canon 6D. Now, if you're familiar with the Canon 6D, you know, and you're probably familiar with it, that it is very bad at high ISO ranges. So this was a very good test for me. I was really excited because this is a huge upgrade from the Canon 6D. By the way, I'm filming this video on the R5, which is why I'm not holding it, showing you these things. I didn't know if I mentioned that in the beginning, but I just wanted to tell you that right now. So uh, the low light, I did a couple of tests. The first test I did was doing some night photography and uh, I'll throw up the pictures on the screen. They are very comparable, but you can see the quality difference when you zoom in on the raw. You can see the cleanness of the image on the R5. Now these were exact same settings and you can definitely, when you zoom in, you could see how the 6D one is much brighter. It is much brighter and that is because of the noise, of the quality is less. The Canon, the R5, much cleaner, images are great, and I was very happy with the quality. To continue the test, I did some shots um, at at dark, like dusk or nighttime, and 
I pumped up the ISO and saw no problems. I also talked to some other users of the R5 and who do a lot of portraiture and stuff and wedding shoots and they said that the ISO is amazing. They've cranked it up to 8,000 to 16,000 and higher and seen little to no noise, which is incredible. I love that. It is, let's put it this way. It is the first camera that I have used that I wasn't afraid to just crank the ISO, that I wasn't afraid to go accidentally too high. The one thing for me is I was always scared to crank the ISO too high on the 6D because the image quality just was, it deteriorated and it looked like crap. With this one, I actually was playing around with it and I took this photo and I think I was at 1600 ISO and I was like, wow, that looks great. I zoomed in, I was like, this is incredible. Then I looked at the settings and I was at 160,000 ISO or something like that. And I was like, that's insane. Like. That is so amazing. So low light camera performs beautifully. Mm, it, is, it is delicious, absolutely delicious. <laughs> Again, remember I am coming from the 6D. I'm not comparing it with the 5D4, not comparing it with the 1D2, 1D3. I don't have experience with those cameras particularly. So the, the reviews might be a little different, but for me coming from a 6D doing what I do for the past two and a half, three years with the 6D to now this, it's just like, woo, hot, man, it is hot. All right, the next question was about the 4K and the 1080. To be honest, uh, I have never shot 120. I've never shot 4K. So I was quite blown away when I was starting to shoot with this. Without getting into too much of explanation and all of that because honestly it comes down to what you look at when you view it. Me personally, it looks so buttery smooth and delicious, I cannot believe it. The 1080, the 60 frames, the 120, they all look so good. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw some clips up here and they're all gonna be from the R5 because someone asked is the 1080 a sampled form of the 4K? I am not 100% sure. I tried to look this up and see if it was but if I was to guess, I would say yes, but I'm not 100%, so don't quote me on that. If you know, comment below and let us let, let everyone know because I would love to know. Uh, so I'm gonna throw up some, some clips that I filmed. Some were 4K 120 and some were 1080 60. And I'm not gonna tell you which ones, and I don't want you to look at the speed. The speed is not a giveaway because I manipulated the speed. I just want you to look at the quality and see if, if you can see the difference. So I'll throw up a couple and you just guess, and then after a couple of seconds, it'll pop up what it is, and we'll see how many you get right. How many did you get right? It's very hard. For me, when I looked, I actually did some tests and had some people look at it and see if they could guess. They couldn't tell the difference. But if you look really close and you can zoom in, you can definitely see the difference. Honestly, I'm not sure how it's gonna look coming on YouTube because it is gonna degrade it a little. But if you saw a difference, then good job. Your eye is better than most. But for me, it looked so good, both of them, that I don't know. Uh, let's see if you can guess. What do you think this is being shot in? Is this video being shot in 4K or 1080? I'll tell you at the end of the video. Okay, and the next question, best feature for a photographer? For me, for this camera, it has been the autofocus feature. The autofocus on this camera is unbelievable. I am just blown away. Like right now, if I look into the monitor, I can see that the eye, the eye detection is tracking my eye. If I move, I'm gonna look at the monitor here. If I move, the eye tracking is following my eye completely. If I do this, it has not moved off at all. At all, still found me. Oh, okay, good, still got me. I mean, it is incredible, the autofocus on this camera. And you have many different options for autofocus. You have a spot, you have a multi-spot, you have uh, a block, and you have many different options. And then you can also, there's a setting you can put where you can touch the screen, and you can, while you're looking through the viewfinder, move your thumb on the screen, and it moves the focus point, and it just focuses right there. It is so freaking cool, I love it. So that is probably the best feature. It just makes photos and focusing that much faster. 
Again, I was coming from the Canon 6D, which had, I think, 36 points of focus, and this has 1,053. Again, I'm not 100% sure on that, but it's just, it's huge difference. So definitely autofocus for the photography uh, feature that I like personally the most. And the last question is, is it worth the price? So after everything that I've said, yes, it is worth the price. I do believe that the overheating issue, because it is a thing, it is an issue. You're, you know, when you have a, a piece of equipment and you're using it, you don't want to have to have that in the back of your mind as a problem. You don't want to think, ooh, you know, I'm filming this wedding and I'm concerned that if I, at one point, if this is going to overheat. You should never have that with a piece of equipment. So that is a little bit of a downfall. With that being said, again, I haven't had the issue with it but I haven't really given it the extent of test. I've used it for several hours and had no problems. It did get warm in the hands, but it is an issue and I do believe that that does take away from the price a little. So, do I think it should be valued probably around $34.99 instead of $38.99? Yes, I think that does take off. But if Canon can come out with a handling for that, then absolutely worth the $38.99. Uh, it, is, it is definitely pricey, but the camera, I mean, I haven't even gotten into probably 20% of this camera and what it can do. Well, maybe not. I, I've probably gotten into about 70% of what this camera can do. But uh, menu-wise, piece of cake. Uh, <laughs> in the beginning, I actually had a little issue changing from camera mode to video mode, and then I figured it out. You had to press the mode button, then info. Again, coming from the 6D, this thing has so many upgrades. So price-wise, uh, I do believe it should be priced at about $34.99, not $38.99, but honestly, I would have I would pay the same amount again for it because of how good it is and because of what it offers you. The final question is from a buddy of mine on Instagram. His name is his handle is Ben Wah. I'll put it right down here. He asked me if I he could have mine. And I, you know, I say no. I say no, he can't not. And uh, just to make this fun. I want you guys to go to his Instagram. It's, I'll put it, again, I'll put it down here. And I want you to comment on some of his photos and say, no Ben, you cannot have Will's R5. That'll be so funny, because I doubt he'll watch, I doubt he'll see this video right at first. So go do that, because it'll make him confused and it'll be glorious. Uh, all right, so a couple of notes on the R5 that I noticed. Uh, me coming from a 6D, which is a uh, SD card only. This camera, the R5, has an SD card and a CF Express. Thing is, I didn't know anything about CF Expresses, so I found out that it's a CF Express Type B. So there are multiple CF Expresses. So if you get this camera and you get a CF Express, make sure it's a Type B CF Express card. The other thing is when you get a reader, because you will need a, an external reader for the CF Express, make sure it's the reader for the CF Express Type B. Because I actually ordered the wrong type and then I had to return it and get the new one. So that's just a couple of points that uh, you should be aware of. I do recommend the 512 gigabyte one. It is ridiculously expensive for a, uh, a card, but I have heard some reports that it does help. The better the storage, the faster the card, the better it helps the overheating issue if you plan on shooting a lot of 4K and 8K. Now, the other thing is, if you aren't familiar with 4K and 8K footage, let me tell you ahead of time, they take a lot of storage. I mean so much storage. I filmed a 12 minute or I, I filmed a 14 minute YouTube video in 4K and it was 12 gigabytes. It takes up a lot of storage. 8K I think is four times that. I'll post what it takes right here. That way you can see the difference. But 1080, super small, 4K, a lot bigger, and then so on and so forth. But um, yeah, it's just something to be known. Your hard drives, you're gonna have to get more hard drives and it's, it, that can get expensive. And that about wraps up the questions and the basic overview of this camera on things that you guys wanna know. Uh, one person asked me, is it worth getting? Here's the thing. If you wanna take really, really good photos, uh, not just for Instagram, just really good photos, you maybe wanna blow them up or you wanna get really high quality or you wanna get really detailed edits. Uh, if you wanna do moderate video, like photo first, video second, and let's say you have the extra money to get the camera and some RF lenses, then absolutely, it is totally worth it. But if you wanna shoot primarily 8K or a lot of 4K, uh, if you don't necessarily have the money to upgrade or you have something that you currently use that works and you don't necessarily need the upgrade, then no, I don't recommend getting the R5. However, if you do end up getting it or end up wanting it, 
I definitely recommend it because it is a great camera. So that's about it. That's about all the questions I can answer. It gives you a broad overview. Now, I bet you you're probably wondering what happened to my lights. Well, I had a softbox that lit the background and the fuse broke or burst or cracked or whatever it did. So I had to get a new fuse. And so now I have these janky lights in the background that don't look good at all. That look like crap. But anyways, I wanted to get this video done for you guys because I know how much you guys wanted this information. So if you have any more questions about the R5, feel free to drop the comments below. I try and get back to all of the questions and leave your Instagram handle in your comments. Cause I like to take a few comments that I get on the YouTube videos and share them onto uh, Instagram. So make sure you leave your Instagram handle so I can tag you. Uh, the other thing is if you like new tips, tricks, first looks, automatic entries to my giveaways that I do, definitely fill the form out below in the description. Uh, if this video was very helpful, go ahead and like it, hit the thumbs up button and subscribe if you haven't already. I do videos like this every Monday at 7 p.m. I know that's a lot of stuff that I just asked you to do. So if you actually do all of that and if you stay to the end of the video, I greatly appreciate it. You are so awesome to come here and watch this whole video. Otherwise, uh, that's it for this one. So you guys have a great one and I will see you guys next Monday.